Uh, we'll be looking together at verses 12 through 16 today as we consider God's reassurance to the anxious. One of the things that we learn from studying Scripture, especially if you study Scripture in the original languages, is that there are a lot of words that address different aspects of anxiety, of fear, of disappointment, of doubt, of confusion. I've just named a few right here in English. And in fact, it's strange to see that the Bible has so many different words for anxiety to compare that with how little this subject is addressed in our pulpits. In fact, uh, I gave a count, I think, somewhere around both Old and New Testament, about 32 words that are used between the, the Hebrew and Greek languages uh, to refer to uh, anxiety in the lectureship book. Uh, after studying that subject further, I've come to learn that that figure is far higher than I originally counted. In fact, it's well over 40 terms are used, both in the Old and New Testaments combined, to address some specific aspect of anxiety. And so it's simply the case that the Bible does address anxiety. It does address the fact that people get confused, that people get frustrated, that people start to ask questions they cannot answer. And as a result of that, it's our responsibility to help people with those questions. Because God seeks in His Word to reassure the anxious, we should, in the preaching of His Word, seek to do the same. And fundamentally, the reason why this is a biblical subject, and I am in no way qualified to talk about clinical anxiety or something like that, but I'm talking about the general practice of anxiety, the general feeling of inadequacy, of frustration, of fear and doubt, and all of those things. But the fact is, anxiety is really, at its core, an expression of a lack of trust in God. Notice in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And so, because the Bible addresses this subject, we should make no excuses. In Philippians 4, beginning in verse 6, this is an imperative in the Bible, a command. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice two elements are specifically mentioned here. If you find yourself in the midst of anxiety, first of all, the Bible commands you stop feeling that way. We don't, we're not comfortable with that, are we? In fact, we, we are inclined to believe, because our culture tells us this is appropriate, when somebody feels a certain way, we need to endorse and reinforce their feelings rather than challenging their feelings. But the Bible says if you feel anxious, you don't trust God enough, so don't feel that way. What should you do? Instead, you should go to God in prayer. I won't rehearse all the things that we talked about yesterday when we discussed the audacity with which we are authorized to pray in Scripture, but one of the things that becomes immediately clear through reading the Word of God is that God can remove the anxiety from our hearts. Now, there may be a case where it is certainly appropriate to see a professional, to talk to a counselor, and, and I'm in no way trying to invalidate that. But what I'm saying is, if we feel anxious, the Bible's answer is not counseling. The Bible's answer is prayer. And we need to appreciate that as a first line of defense before we go the clinical route. But the second thing, it's not only prayer, but it's thanksgiving. How often do you stop and give thanks? What is the point when our prayer moves from please to thank you. A lot of the times when I pray, I find myself asking for favors from God rather than thanking Him for the blessings He's already given. It's more, more, more rather than thank you for what you've done. When we face the problem of anxiety, one of the first things we can do is go to God in prayer and realize how gracious He has already been, how good He already is, and to fellowship and communicate that goodness to Him and thank Him for being who He is. 
But then secondly, I think the Bible says the answer to anxiety is humility. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, here is how you address this problem of anxiety. Anxiety fundamentally says, I am in control. But humility says, God is in control. In 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7, humble yourselves, the Bible says, therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. When you feel anxious, when anxiety enters your life, what do you do? You give it to God. You pile all of it up and you push it across the table and say, God, this belongs to you. I won't carry this anymore. I'm not going to struggle. I'm not going to face these demons in my life, as we sometimes call them. Instead, I'm turning them over to you. I'm surrendering myself for you to work and mold as you see fit. Soren Kierkegaard once said that God creates everything out of nothing. And those of us whom he creates, he must first reduce to nothing. God wants to create something special within you today. He wants to mold and shape your life in accordance with his will. But in order to do that, you must first give yourself to him in order to be molded. The Bible says in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, that we are to present our bodies a what? Living sacrifice. Foster says on that verse, the problem with living sacrifices is that they're always trying to crawl off the altar. That's true, isn't it? That rather than submitting ourselves to God, rather than putting ourselves out there and say, Lord, whatever you want, that is what I want. Instead, it's often tempting to say, Lord, let me keep just a little bit of my own control. Let me hold a little bit of my frustration and anxiety and doubt just so I won't completely lose sight of what I'm all about. The Bible tells us less of me and more of God is how we reduce the anxieties in our life. Sometimes people read Luke chapter 10, which of course famously tells this parable of the Good Samaritan. By the way, can I pull this jacket off? I feel like a mule working up here. I tell you what, uh, yesterday was worse than today, I think. Thank you for that, by the way. In Luke chapter 10, when Jesus is about to tell the story of the Good Samaritan, the Bible says of the lawyer that he was what? Seeking to justify himself. And sometimes when we get really uh, hard on that lawyer and say, well, he shouldn't have been doing that. And the reality is, how often is that the case with us? Where so often we find ourselves challenged in what we believe when we read the word of God, but we seek to justify ourselves to prove that in fact we couldn't possibly be wrong, that we couldn't possibly have studied all of these things and all of these years never noticed this passage or never understood this principle. We constantly are shaping ourselves in accordance with the will of God, a process that never stops, a process that should never uh, grow tired in our life. With these preliminary thoughts in mind, let's go to Exodus chapter 33 and let's examine verses 12 and 13 today. Exodus 33 verses 12 and 13. This is where Moses is, of course, on the mountain of God where we met him yesterday and we're still in the aftermath of the golden calf. And Moses is feeling very anxious about his relationship with God, about his relationship with the people. In verses 12 and 13, Scripture says these words. Moses says to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you also have found favor in my sight. Can you imagine if God said those words about you? That I know you by name, you found favor in my sight, and still you can't quite believe it? Notice verse 13. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, consider too that this nation is your people. 
This first stage introduces us to the anxiety of uncertainty. What do you do when you do not know? Where do you turn when you do not understand? You see, oftentimes what we choose to do when we don't understand is study more. Because we feel like the answers can always be discovered. Or maybe you will ask a respected scholar or friend their opinion. Because if you don't know, they are bound to know. And you know, we sometimes figure out that nobody seems to have good answers to some of these complicated questions. In fact, one of the things that I appreciate the most about respected teachers is the willingness to say, I don't know. Sometimes the best answer you can give is, I don't know. I preach a sermon sometimes called, Things People Say About the Bible That the Bible Does Not Say About Itself. And my, my students have heard me say this before. One of the things that I always point out is, the Bible is easy to understand. Now, I'm not trying to indict anybody who may have said that, but how many of us have heard that? The Bible is easy to understand. I find it interesting, the one time the Bible itself comments on that point, in 2 Peter 3, it says, Paul wrote some things that are, what? Hard to understand. The Holy Spirit knows a little bit better than we do that maybe not everything in the Word of God is so simple. Maybe not everything has an easy answer. And no matter how much study I put into something, no matter how much I challenge myself, no matter how many languages I know, no matter how much history and archaeology I know, sometimes there just isn't a good answer. And it's in those moments that we can best learn to trust in God. Some, in, some people have reached the point of thinking they can only believe the Bible if they can confirm the Bible with something outside the Bible. Are you aware of this phenomenon? That the Bible is only trustworthy if a source outside the Bible, whether that be secular science, whether that be history, whether that be archaeology, if something outside the Bible confirms the Bible, well then we are authorized to accept what Scripture teaches. Could I suggest that we may have gotten that wrong if in fact that's the way we've operated? I know Josephus is right because he agrees with Luke. I don't know Luke is right because he agrees with Josephus. I believe the narrative in 2 Kings is historical because it's the narrative of 2 Kings. Now, if there are some inscriptions and artifacts from ancient Assyria that help to confirm that, well, that's pretty neat. I can show those pictures in class and keep students from going to sleep another three minutes. But I believe 2 Kings not because of something found in secular history. I believe it because it's in 2 Kings. And we create this anxiety of uncertainty among many people today by giving them this false expectation that they should not believe the Bible unless they can confirm that knowledge with something outside the Bible. If you're doing that, please stop. Please teach them the Word of God is the Word of God. And there are reasons to believe it to be sure. Yes, it can be confirmed, but the fact is it is true and it deserves to speak with an authoritative voice in our lives because it is the Word of God, not because it can be confirmed with something outside of itself that is uninspired. We create a lot of uncertainty unnecessarily by placing false expectations on Scripture, by making false claims about Scripture, claims the Bible does not even make about itself. Notice when we get to the text, Moses is in doubt of God's personal accompaniment. We understand that Moses had been given assurances, but they weren't quite enough. It's like us reading the word of God and reading those promises and knowing they're true and believing they're true, yet feeling there's something missing from our faith. Moses felt that too. In Latin... Christianity, some of the church fathers referred to this as the theme of Deus Absconditus, the hidden God. Sometimes it appears that God hides, that when we spread out our hands and call to him in prayer, he is nowhere to be found. When we search for his presence in our lives, we still feel empty because he's not filling our lives. You know this feeling from the Psalms. 
in Psalm 13, verses 1 and 2, there the psalmist asks these challenging questions at the beginning of that chapter. How long, O Lord, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? By the way, the word face in the Hebrew Bible is the same word for presence. How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Have you ever felt that way? You don't have to answer right here, but answer within yourselves. Have you ever felt that way? Have you been so desperate for God in life that you've gone to Him in prayer and expressed that desperation and you didn't feel any better? Now, we could probably tell opposite stories. There are times where we've been in similar situations and we've prayed to God and we instantly feel better. But have you ever felt that God is silent in your life? That He's not acting on your behalf? That everything is going wrong? I know some of you, no doubt, have. But notice the assurance Scripture gives us that God is always there. Even when He appears hidden, He is there. I think it's an interesting observation in Exodus chapter 3. Moses comes into contact with a miraculous sight, a bush that was burning but was not burned up, and yet he had to be told to take off his shoes. For he did not know that where he was standing was holy ground. There are times in our lives where we are in the presence of God and we don't even know it. I'm not in any way comparing Fried Hardeman with the presence of God. But for the sake of illustration, it is pretty frequent for visitors to our campus, especially alumni, to come back. And they will speak in chapel and they will talk about how their years spent on this campus were the best years of their lives. And things they took for granted they now miss. Our students have heard this story time and time again. And you sort of roll your eyes because at the time you don't really think about all of that. But it's a reminder that sometimes some of our moments of greatest blessing, we don't even realize we're being blessed. And all of us are blessed to be here. To sit at the feet of great men of God and to hear them preach the word of God to challenge us and educate and encourage us. What a blessing that is. A lot of people don't have that opportunity. Sometimes we don't recognize when we're in the presence of God. And think about Moses. No one had been in such close communion with him. Numbers 12 tells us there was no one like Moses in all the earth. He had a special relationship more than any human being who ever walked the face of this planet with the exception of Jesus Christ. And yet Moses is communing with the very presence of God on Mount Sinai, and he doesn't even realize it. He feels alone even in God's presence. Maybe you felt that way as well. In Psalm 37 and verse 25, the Bible assures us, I have been young, but now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. David says, I look around at people and I don't see a whole lot of righteous folks starving to death. You know why? Because God takes care of even the physical needs. You don't have to believe in a health and wealth gospel to believe what the Bible says there. God takes care of even the physical needs of his people. But notice it goes deeper. In Joshua 1 and verse number 5. God assures Joshua, who also is facing a very anxious situation, about to lead God's people into the promised land. For the first time in his life, he's alone without Moses to encourage him. And God says to Joshua, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so also I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. God is always with his people, whether we feel his presence or not. We have assurance in scripture, he's there. Notice also, Moses distrusts God's personal assurance. God, you've told me that there's nobody like me. You've called me by name. You've chosen me, and yet I don't feel it. I don't feel your presence. 
he distrusts God's personal assurance. Sometimes we cry, and sometimes we wait. I think the opening verses of the book of Hebrews are interesting. How God, who at various times and in various ways, some people skip right over what that's saying. What is it? What exactly the author of Hebrews is saying is that the consistency and the clarity of God's message in the Old Testament could not be relied upon to be delivered dependently. In fact, we find a number of cases in the Hebrew Bible where God's people are seeking, what exactly does God want of us? Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 28, when King Saul goes and seeks out the witch at Endor. Very mysterious passage. But you remember what motivates that search for a witch is he wants a word from God. And he sought out the prophets and they have no answer. And he's searched for the oracles of the temple or the tabernacle, and there is no answer. And so finally he goes to this medium to conjure up the spirit of Samuel. Surely if anybody knows the will of God, it would be Samuel. You see, the fact is people didn't always have a consistent, clear message from God in the Old Testament. Yet today God has spoken to us through the Son. We always have full access to his complete revelation, once for all, delivered to the saints. But that doesn't mean it makes us feel as though God is with us. Even though we have his word, even though we have everything we need pertaining to life and godliness, sometimes our emotions conquer our knowledge. In Psalm 69, David gives in this very graphic illustration, Save me, O God. For the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. Imagine a situation where you're being drowned and you can't breathe. And when you scream, nothing comes out. No one can hear your call. David says, that's how I feel. God, you're nowhere to be found. You're nowhere to be seen. I'm struggling. I'm fighting. My enemies are attacking me. And where are you? When are you going to come and do something? There's evil and there is injustice aimed at me from every direction. And you're nowhere to help. Never felt that way. You ever felt, feel like the brethren are taking shots at you preachers? And you don't deserve it? Do you ever feel like people are judging you unnecessarily? taking shots at you without cause, making fun of the very things you hold most sacred in your belief system. Do you ever feel that way? When you are persecuted, when you feel alone, even when it appears God is not with you, let me assure you, Scripture tells us He's listening. And by means of those challenging situations where you feel alone, God is working within you unbelievable strength. See it through. John Chrysostom says these words in his commentary on the paralytic in Mark's gospel. Fourth century church father writes these words, knowing therefore that God is more tenderly loving than all physicians. Do not inquire too curiously concerning his treatment, nor demand an account of it from him. But whether he is pleased to let us go free or whether he punishes, let us offer ourselves for either alike. Let me stop there and let's appreciate the illustration. You go to the doctor because there's something wrong with you. And the doctor prescribes medication that has some pretty severe uh, um, uh, side effects that are associated with it. Do you say to the doctor, how dare you ask me to do anything that's even the slightest bit uncomfortable? Do you do that? No, most people say, well, if I'm going to suffer, go ahead and let me suffer. If I have to take this medicine in order to ultimately get over this illness I have, I'm willing to suffer a little bit to become better in the end. But with the Heavenly Father, with the Heavenly Physician, that's not how people respond, is it? 
Instead, people say, God, how could you allow even the slightest bit of, of discomfort in my life? How could you let me lose my job after all these years? How could you let people talk about me that way? How could you let me face just a little bit of suffering? What are you trying to do to me? We treat doctors with, with more respect than God. Going on in the quotation. By the way, we're not the first people perhaps to feel that way as his illustration makes plain. For he, God, seeks by means of each, of each case of suffering, to lead us back to health and to communion with himself. And he knows our several needs and what is expedient for each one and how and what manner we ought to be saved. And along that path, he leads us. Let us follow then wherever he bids us, and let us not too carefully consider whether he commands us to go by a smooth and easy path or a difficult and rugged one. Offer ourselves to God for whatever his will for us is. If that's pain and suffering, so be it. If it is glory and comfort, so be it. Whatever God wants, that's what I want. Do we really feel that way? Or do we shake our fist at God and accuse him of being silent, accuse him of being absent, accuse him of being nowhere to be found, even though we've demanded time and again that he show up and come to our aid? Finally, Moses demands national attention. Notice he says at the end of that verse, verse number 13, and consider, too, that this nation is your people. God, don't forget what you've done. Don't forget your promise to Abraham. Don't forget to save your people as you promised you would. In Deuteronomy 9 and verse 5, here's what the Bible says. Not because of your own righteousness, speaking to Israel, or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land. But because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord is driving them out before you, and that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The reason God is saving you, Israel, is not because of you. It is not because of your own righteousness. It's not even because you've cried out to God. It's because of his promise. We all participate in God's plan. And he's got a plan for my life and yours. He's got a plan for the United States of America. He's got a plan for his world. We may not know what that is, but you can best be sure we will participate in it, either according to our will or against it. Number two, Moses experiences the anxiety of isolation. Verses 14 through 16, the text tells us, and he said, God, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Notice the pronouns. If you're not going to be with me, then do not bring us any further. Verse 16, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, is it not? And you're going with us? So that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth. You know what made Israel different? It wasn't Egyptian slavery. It wasn't even their national heritage. It wasn't faithfulness. It wasn't covenant. What really made Israel different is God. God was with them. And the only thing that makes us different from people of the world is that the people of the world do not know our God. They don't serve Him. They don't worship Him. They don't live for Him to please Him in everything they do. That's the distinguishing factor. And if we're not living for God in the church, we have no right to exist. We need to appreciate that we are not alone as God's people, either as individuals or as a corporate body. God is with His people. But Moses fears this personal abandonment. God, if you won't go with me, then we're wasting our time out in this wilderness. Notice in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9, the Bible there says something that I believe is profound. 
For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. What is God doing? Well, the Bible says, at least here, that he is running through the earth, scanning the hearts of human beings to see if there is anyone who is blameless who needs his help. What an amazing comfort that is. We should preach that assurance. We should preach that promise that God is looking to help us in whatever way we can please him. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, in verse number 26, the Bible says that Saul, after he had been anointed as king, this is still during the days of the good Saul, before he becomes the bad Saul. But the Bible says in 1 Samuel 10, verse 26, Saul also went to his home at Gibeah, and with him went men of valor. The word really doesn't mean valor, it means men who are heroes, spiritual heroes, physical heroes, men who are honorable. Men of, as I've explained this, gravitas. That's a pop culture word, I think. With him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. God touches the hearts of men. He did even in the Old Testament. How much the more in the New but also God fears, or Moses fears, God's national abandonment. The ignorance of God's presence is just as trying as God's absence. Sometimes God is working in people's lives and they don't even know it because they're not looking for him. Paul tells us in Acts 17 in verses 26 and 7 that the Lord, who was unknown as a God to the Athenians, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Here's why. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. The idea being that we are created to locate God. And whenever we don't find God, we try to fill that hole in our lives with a variety of other things. The ignorance of God's presence can be just as damaging as God's absence. Because we seek to fill our lives with things that take the place of God, but have no hope of doing so. It may be materialism. It may be sexual temptation. It may be various other things that we find to spend our time in, but the truth of the matter is nothing can fill that hole in life except for God Almighty. He is the creator of heaven and earth, and he can reconstruct our lives from the mess of sin that is often left behind. So the question is, in Moses' case, how could he trust what he could not see? How could he trust God when God could not be seen, when God's presence wasn't obvious? Now Moses felt alone with the presence of God swirling around in a storm cloud atop Mount Sinai. A storm so obvious and fierce the children of Israel tell Moses, uh, why don't you speak with God and leave us down here to be safe? If Moses felt alone when God's presence was so obvious, what does that say about us? in the danger we have to feel alone. The pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, Exodus 13 and verse 21, had led the people. Now they had the cyanatic storm cloud to reveal the presence of God. But Moses had no assurance that God would continue. Remember we talked about yesterday that God's past is a guarantee of his people's future. That what God has been is an assurance of what he will be. But that's hard to accept, isn't it? Even if we recognize God's grace in the past, even though we see all the wonderful things he's done for us, we still don't have that absolute certainty that he will continue to do those things. So how do we trust in what we do not see? Well, let me ask you something. Isn't that the essence of faith? Isn't that what Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 describes as faith? For we walk by what? 
faith and not by. If our faith is based only in the things we can see, then we really don't have faith. If I have to be able to prove everything I believe before I'm willing to give my intellectual consent to it, then I will never really believe anything. Because the truth is, every matter of faith always involves a small element of uncertainty. A lot of times I get the pleasure of talking to young and old people. I was going to say young people, but it's true of all people. And they have questions about Scripture. Sometimes these questions are very difficult and challenging, and they're big picture questions. How can God be omniscient? Or how can God be omnipotent or omnibenevolent? You know, some of these things. But sometimes they're just minor issues in the text, and in the course of their study they've discovered, and it's disturbing them and challenging them. And I try to remind them in the midst of those conversations, whatever we decide, whatever you, as a result of your own study and reflection and prayer, decide, don't think leaving just a little bit room for, uh, uh, for faith is a bad thing. Don't think it's wrong to say, God, I do not know, but I believe. God, I cannot explain, but I trust. You see, I think one of the reasons why so many young people leave the church, I don't know this to be statistically true, but I feel it's true, is that they come expecting to be able to answer every question they have. And when there isn't a perfect answer, they say, well, my faith is useless. I don't think they ought to feel that way. Because I believe that faith always involves an element of mystery. Something we cannot fully understand. And after all, if our faith is in God, who among us can truly understand and explain Him? Even when His presence is not obvious, it's there. Even when He does not make Himself plain, He is still guiding and leading and working behind the scenes for us. God wants what is best for all people, especially when those people are anxious. And one of the most challenging aspects of our faith is learning to lean on God even in the absence of absolute proof, even when He is silent. In the 1998 book entitled Sister, Sister, a Holocaust survivor, Anna Rosner Bly, recounts the memory of a three-line inscription scribbled on a wall at Auschwitz. And it said these words, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even when I don't feel it. And I believe in God, even when He's silent. Have a blessed day.